Nomine Patris et Fidi, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus Tecum, benedicta tuum diarbus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre. Amen. In nomine Patris et Fidi, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Brethren in Christ, laudate to Jesus Christus in secula. This is Timothy Flanders at the Meaning of Catholic. Jesus is King. It is the 22nd week after Pentecost. Thanks be to God. It's a great week to be a Catholic. I'm really excited for the fall festivals. We've got Christ the King coming up. Um, we've already had Michaelmas. Um, and this week is another great week with two very important feasts to me that I love a lot uh, that we're going to talk about in a minute. Uh, before, I wanted to give everyone the good news because this is a very important moment in the history of the 21st century church, I think, because we have the republication of a, a good chunk of St. Alphonsus's works. Tan Books has done it. Thank you, Tan Books, for doing this. I, I wanted to show you on my shelf. Here's where they are right here. I think this is, yeah, I'm missing one of them because I have the Eucharist book in my car when I visit, when I stop by the the blessed sacrament but this is this is the this is the type of beautiful book that was necessary to publish saint alphonsus's works there was an english complete works that i think it was in the 19th century sometime that went out of print and tan books has put five of his works into print now and produced them in these beautiful books it's, it's i think it's very important that alphonsus gets in a text like this that it looks like this because of the importance of Alphonsus's works for the modern church. Uh, you know, this can't just be, you know, something like this. It's got to be a volume that expresses the importance and the grandeur of this saint's works in particular, uh, because they're so powerful. They're so rich in so many different ways and it's really i mean it's really quite remarkable this this doctor of the church how prolific he really was and he goes from the most you know the technical theology philosophy patristic scriptural scholastic type of thing to the most powerful devotional works and these prayers i mean the man is another saint thomas aquinas in terms of the the mystical power of his words the devotional power of his words and his coming from this deep prayer life as well as this intellectual rigor i mean it really is just another level so i i i'm just so excited for this publication from from tan books um i think the downside is that each one of these volumes is 50 dollars. they're expensive um that is a downside obviously not everyone can afford a 50 dollars volume of these um but at least in the united states i mean i think i would encourage you to save up 50 dollars to just buy one of them at least but not buying the whole set but the, there's the passion and death of christ which i've been using for my daily meditation um in the morning and in particular we have preparation for death this is it's hard to overestimate the importance of remembering your death for your spiritual life and this is one of the best texts that i've ever seen for it preparation for death and then i have the eucharist volume in my car um, which has visits to the blessed sacrament all sorts of eucharistic devotions and then they also published uh the glories of mary the marian text of his as well as the infancy this is the the incarnation, birth, and infancy of, of Jesus Christ, and this is it has a ton of devotional texts for Christmas and Epiphany, and I'm really excited to use these in the coming season, which is coming soon, of course. So that's exciting as well. So, so I just want to say thank you to Tan Books. We're going to have uh, a podcast with Dan Burke talking more in depth about Alphonsus, but this is really a great help to the church. I'm really excited for this 
this free publication. So thank you to Tan Books for doing that. So 22nd Sunday after Pentecost. So the, let's pull this up here. So on the, uh, we have St. John Cantius. That's the, uh, the uh, big church in my region, in the Great Lakes region of the United States. Uh, the big church is in Chicago, St. John Cantius. Um, and then, so, but today is the feast of Blessed Emperor Carl. And Blessed Emperor Carl, so 1021, what's interesting is that when, when uh, Blessed Carl was canonized, or he was beatified by St. John Paul II, uh, Pope Carol Wojtyla, Carol Wojtyla was actually named, his own father was also named Carol, which is the Polish version of, oh, I, I think I have a guest commentator. All right. So what's really interesting about Blessed Emperor Carl is that, uh, as I said, Carol Wojtyla's father was also named Carol. Carol is the Polish name for Charles. But Carol Wojtyla Sr. was so impressed by Emperor Carl, he named his son also Carol after Blessed Emperor Carl. So when John Paul II beatified Emperor Carl, he beatified his own namesake. And what's interesting is he assigned this date for his feast day, which is actually the anniversary of his wedding to Princess Zita. So they were married on this day, October 21. So this is their marriage day, which kind of um, foreshadows a, a beatification and canonization also of the Empress Zita, who is currently a servant of God. So hopefully... God willing, in the future, they'll have their uh, their feast day together on their anniversary. We'd have another married couple along with uh, Louis and Zelly to be on the calendar as a part with their uh, wedding. Now, in this text, this is the, this is the must read text. If you want to learn about Bless Blessed Emperor Carl, Blessed Charles of Austria by Charles Cologne. And I, I read this text. Uh, it was one of my uh, one of my comfort texts in in a time of great sorrow in my own life, and one of the most powerful scenes is when Blessed Emperor Carl is dying. He's dying in exile on the island of Madeira. He's been betrayed by his own people, uh, whom he only sought to serve and sacrifice himself as a good king. And he's dying, and he calls for his son to come in at his deathbed because he wants to show his son an example of dying like a Christian. And so, this, I mean, it's just so awesome, this man of God. And as I said, not only that, Empress Zita is, is just an incredible figure. So uh, then we have the, uh, tomorrow is October 22nd. That is the feast day of Pope St. John Paul II. Now, John Paul II is such an interesting figure, a very charismatic Pole who comes kind of out of nowhere and takes up the papacy uh, in fulfillment to an alleged Polish prophecy, by the way. Um, but I just wanted to recommend this book because I have, uh, as I've said before to people, I have... Uh, you know, I became Catholic in 2013, shortly after Pope Francis was elected. I was Eastern Orthodox, so I came into communion with Rome. And I've never been a Catholic under Pope Benedict. I heard a lot about Pope Benedict when I came in. People were very excited about him, sad that he had uh, resigned. But then there's this older generation of Catholics who are huge fans of John Paul II. And I never really understood that, and I sought to understand it more. And as I learned more about John Paul II, 
I I really saw like, wow, this guy is truly an amazing modern saint. And I I read many of the critiques of John Bull too. There is a uh, a book w- written by the SSPX. Where is that? Did I put it on this? Uh, no, I think it's I think it's in another shelf. But um, there is a um, there's a, a book written by the SSPX called uh, I think it's called John Bull to Beatified Question Mark which critiques various aspects of theology. And I found it to be very superficial, not very uh, deep to really penetrate the depths of what John Paul II was really getting at. Uh, John Paul II is a difficult man to understand uh, because he's writing his first language is Polish. He's writing with a Polish mindset, which is a very unique one. It's a Slavic, a Latin Slavic mindset and worldview. And the uh, the Polish worldview of what freedom is causes him to use a lot of the same language as liberalism, classical liberalism, that is the condemned proposition, the heretical proposition of liberalism. Uh, Poles use a lot of that same language, but they mean something totally different than what we would mean in America, for example, about liberty and freedom. Uh, and here's a text that Angelico Press just put out, A Pope for All Seasons. And this is so. This is by Angelico Press. Uh, I know many trads would appreciate Angelico Press, but this is just an example of many, many different testimonies. Uh, Bishop Athanasius Schneider also gives the same testimony in his book, Christus Vincit, that his impression of John Paul II was a man in deep union with God, uh, a man of deep prayer. So I, I think that there are just and valid criticisms of John Paul II. I think he was incautious. That was one of his, uh, you know, one of his great character, his virtues was his charisma. One of his great virtues was his charisma. But as with all of us, the the great our greatest virtues can also be our weaknesses. And I think there was some in caution with many of his acts as Pope John Paul II. Nevertheless, uh, what I'll I'll do here, the thumbnail for this this um, broadcast is promoting one of our guild series, and that's something that I'll I'll get into in just a minute. But first, I just wanted to get back to the calendar about what is exciting for this week. So we have Saint Anthony Mary Claret, and then we also have Saint Raphael. And it's, I think it's important that we have these special feast days. It's unfortunate that this was lost in the new calendar because it's important to have devotion to the particular angels. Uh, so this is really an angelic time of year. We've got Michaelmas, we've got the guardian angels, we've got St. Raphael. And I think that's important. I, I love Tobias. I, I just read the Tobit recently. It's just such a powerful book about the marriage against the devil, marriage against the devil. Um, so then we have uh, St. Isidore the Farmer and Our Lady on, on Saturday, but I wanted to highlight on Friday, there is, on Friday, there is in fact, the martyrs, the new martyrs of England and Wales. There's 40 martyrs that were canonized in 1970 by paul the sixth and they were assigned this feast day october 25 and there's another feast day in england england versus wales but uh perhaps you've heard of saint john campion he's among these 40 martyrs and i just wanted to share this text that i've been really helpful to me this is a reprint from sophia press mementos of the english martyrs and confessors so this text is really great because it has a daily reading. It has a daily reading so you can read about the English martyrs and confessors every single day. So a little a little excerpt. Uh, and for me, it's very powerful because I am an Anglo. My first language is English uh, as an American. And I think that Americans need to reconnect with their English cultural roots as Anglos. 
And it's, it's very powerful to read these texts every day to get connected with the English martyrs. I think the uh, reconversion of the Anglo empire to the Catholic faith is a critical piece that uh, Anglos like myself need to focus on. Um, and I, it's, it's no mistake that we had the Catholic emancipation of England, England and Ireland in the 19th century. And then we had the Oxford movement. We have St. John Henry Newman. We have the um, uh, later on the ordinary, but we have all these recent canonization of all these ancient, uh, not ancient, but, you know, traditionally venerated uh, martyrs and confessors. And it's exciting. It's an exciting moment because, by the way, this was something that St. Paul of the Cross, the founder of the Passionist Order, he prayed for this for 50 years. And he was a great saint of the, in, the, in the, uh, the 18th century. And he died before uh, this sort of vision that he had could really come to any fruition. But it seems quite clear that God is answering his prayers because shortly after that, the Passionist missionaries went to England and they were involved in the conversion of St. John Henry Newman and others. And I think we are seeing the reconversion of England in, in, a, in a small but powerful mustard seed in our time. So this is an exciting moment to be a Catholic, considering the history of England. Now, So uh, there's one, one last point that we wanted to raise here regarding John Paul II. Um, and that is going to this guild stream here, the uh, John Paul II, John, St. John Paul II and St. Marcel the Moderate, question mark. So this is a book that I am writing, which will eventually be released uh, in the coming years. And the, so the, the title of the book is St. John Paul II and St. Marcel, the moderate question mark, myth busting two great churchmen of the 20th century myth busting, because as I see it, there are many myths and false accusations and slogans that are just superficial, basically about these two men, John Paul II and Archbishop Lefebvre. And the reason is obvious. Uh, Catholics have been divided into these various camps. And because of these camps, they kind of just hurl these slogans at each other. And they're just really unjust. They're unjust because they are, they, they're prideful. They're prideful because they're not in conformity with the truth. The truth is that I think an objective look at these two churchmen would find them both to be great men of holiness and prayer who were doing the best they could with the knowledge that they had. But both of them had certain weak points, too. And I think that's I think that is an objective and reasonable thing to assert. And I think we need to come back to all of us need to say this is. It is reasonable to say John Paul II was a great, great man of holiness. It is reasonable to say Archbishop Lefebvre was a great man of holiness. Even if you disagree with particular actions and words of the particular men, that's fine. But you need to at least admit that there is a reasonable case to be made here. And we need to stop throwing around these slogans. So and one of these slogans is... John Paul II, Carol Wojtyla, was a phenomenologist. That's a, that's a slogan. It's not true. So when you classify, when you label Carol Wojtyla as a phenomenologist, typically this is done in order to disparage him in a pejorative way. Uh, but it's, it's simply not true. It's not true that he was a phenomenologist. And I'm going to read some text here to, to show that. But in our series, we go in-depth into... Uh, the texts of Carol Wojtyla, his early years. Um, if you want to have an actual phenomenologist, you want to go to Dietrich von Hildebrand. He definitely was a phenomenologist. Definitely. 
but not John Ball too. He was very critical of one of the greatest phenomenologists that von Hildebrand himself was a disciple of, but Hildebrand was critical, and I'm talking about Max Scheler. Max Scheler was uh, one of the greatest phenomenologists of the 20th century. Um, Dietrich von Hildebrand was a close friend of his. Scheler was a Catholic, but he was unfortunately not very pious. He died excommunicated, actually, because he uh, because of his divorce and remarriage. Um, but he, he did have a, a number of great insights. And von Hildebrand takes these and runs with them. And he creates a whole ethical system based on an Augustinian phenomenology. As opposed to a, uh, a non-realistic phenomenology, which is anti-Christian, you cannot have any sort of uh, anti-realistic philosophy uh, affecting Christianity. But J John Paul II does something different. He does not critique and then Shaler and then stay in the same phenomenological stream. He critiques Shaler by saying that he needs to be more Thomistic. And this is something we discussed. Here's the um, CUA Press has, has been putting out Kurovoitiwa's complete works, which is another great help to the church. Um, so in, in our, in our podcast, we've, we've dealt with the first text here, person and act. And we talk about in the, the, the podcast we've done publicly, as well as the guild stream, how the, the bad translation and in, into English, the original translation into English of this text contributed to this myth that Carol Wojtyla was a phenomenologist and Carol Wojtyla was in caution himself was, is, was partially due to this because Carol Wojtyla seemed to not care how he was characterized, even if it was false or whatever. He just sort of let people say things about him and didn't really care about what was said. And to a degree, that's virtuous. But to another degree, it's incautious. So the volume two right here is the Lublin Lectures and Works on Max Shaler. So Carol Wojtyla did his, he had two different dissertations. His first dissertation was under uh, Carol Gulagrange, the greatest Thomist of the time. Um, and, that, and that was on St. John of the Cross. And then his second dissertation was an investigation of Max Shaler, whether or not Max Shaler can be utilized in a Catholic ethical system. And he, so the funny thing is von Hildebrand answered that question and he said, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> von Hildebrand said, answered the question and he said, yes. Whereas John Paul II said, no. And this is what, this is one of the factors that no one who critiques John Paul II, I, I've never seen a single critique of John Paul II that actually has read these texts, gone into depth about actually understanding the man. And so by the way, you know, if, if this is, this is what, you know, disciples of Archbishop Lefebvre, rightly, they they say to everyone else, hey, why don't you actually understand the man before you critique him? Why don't you actually read Archbishop Lefebvre's works? Why don't you, we just had Bishop Tissier just died. Rest in peace. Uh, Bishop Tissier is the author of the biography. You know, SSPXers rightly say, hey, why don't you actually read the biography before you, you know, tell everybody that Archbishop of Five is a schismatic. Yes, absolutely. That would be a just thing for a Christian to do to try to judge the truth according to the truth. But the same is true for John Ball too. It cuts both ways. So you really have to dig into this stuff to really understand a man. Um, and as I said, John Ball too is very dense and difficult to understand. I, I it took me it took me about a year to read his first text, Person and Act. And uh, I mean, I annotated it heavily, but I would say I still don't understand it. I mean, I think I understand. I grasp it a lot better than these superficial critiques, but it's it's a difficult text. It's very difficult, very dense. I'm certainly not gifted philosophically, so it was, it's was it been tough. But I So in volume two, I'm just going to read some of the texts because the very first um lecture on Shaler. um is critiquing Shaler, as i said so um it, it's very interesting because he he goes into a lot of depths but i'm just going to read from the conclusion page 16 
uh, some of the negative comments that John Paul II makes here. So, and by the way, this is this is Carol Wojtyla. So back when he was a priest and a and a professor, way back. Uh, this, so this would have been in the fifties, I believe, uh, when he wrote these things, this lecture. Carol Wojtyla says Shaler holds that the efficacy of the person cannot be ascertained on the basis of phenomenological experiences. In other words, the person does not experience himself as the efficient cause. This position is fallacious because it has an erroneous grasp of experiential facts. Shaler's conception falsifies his experience rather than taking it into account and helping to interpret it. Those are just some negative comments he's concluding after investigating Shaler's works. But listen to, listen to what he says now. Man experiences not only felicity or despair due to his moral goodness and malice, but also the sense of responsibility in which this goodness and malice occur in a close connection with the commitment of his person in the act, that is, his efficacy. So John Paul Carboti was saying, you are experiencing, you act good or evil, and you experience that that act is good or evil, and then you experience the fact that you become good or evil based on those acts. So it's basically a, 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 an examination of a conscience, and he's looking at the examination of conscience from a philosophical perspective. Nonetheless, Shaler did not perceive any of this. In his understanding, particularly volitions turn only to other objective values, but to the ethical value they not only do not, but simply cannot turn. This would impede emotion, which exclusively discovers and manifests this value in the person. However, in what way this value is born in the person is neither answered for, in fact, even asked by Shaler. The entire essential sphere concerning the ethical act, which played so important a role in the old philosophy built on Aristotle and Thomas, was in fact lost by him. So he's criticizing Shaler, saying Shaler does not base, does not take into account the realistic philosophy of St. Thomas. Continuing on, the very expression formal bore a mark of a Kantian a priori formalism and therefore was omitted ex toto. Indeed, Shaler's entire ethical system proceeded from his opposition to formalism, and its author adopted intuitionist epistemological presuppositions without supposing that the formal moment of thought and act does not have to be situated exclusively on the side of the subject, as in Kant, and in other words, subjectivism, but is also situated on the side of the object, as in St. Thomas Aquinas. So. Carol Wojtyla, way back in the 50s, is critiquing Shaler, the foremost phenomenologist, because he lacks Thomistic presuppositions. Now, let's go over to what's interesting is that his, so Carol Wojtyla consistently critiqued phenomenolo phenomenology based on St. Thomas. So, and, and this, this comes out in his later work too. So this is from Memory and Identity, published in 2005. So here's one of his uh, 2005 pages, five to twelve. This is on um, this is on a post on CatholicCulture.org, ideologies of evil. And he makes this remark here at the end. He says, "If we wish to speak rationally about good and evil, we have to return to Saint Thomas Aquinas, that is, to the philosophy of being." With the phenomenological method, for example, we can study experiences of morality, religion, or simply what it is to be human and draw from them a significant enrichment of our knowledge. Yet we must not forget that all these analyses implicitly presuppose the reality of the absolute being and also the reality of being human, that is, being a creature. If we do not set out from such realist presuppositions, we end up in a vacuum, end quote. So 50 years later, John Paul II Carol Wojtyla, now as the Pope, is saying the same thing he said 50 years earlier in his critique of Shaler. In other words, yes, you can use certain phenomenological methods, but you have to presuppose a realistic metaphysics based on St. Thomas Aquinas. So in this, he's far more Thomistic. So he's, he, he's, he's acting as a Thomist in the sense that St. Thomas did dialogue with certain philosophies of his day. He talked with Averroes and Avicenna and Mema, uh, Rambam, uh, uh, the, the 
uh, Moshe Maimonides. Um, but this is way more. This is way more than what Dietrich von Hildebrand says in his book, What is Philosophy? He In, in What is Philosophy, he says, uh, phenomenology is realistic. True phenomenology is realistic philosophy. And von Hildebrand has is more critical of St. Thomas, uh, partly because he von Hildebrand really never, I don't think he ever experienced any good Thomas. All the Dominicans in Germany of his day were not very good Thomas, whereas uh, Carol Wojtyla was trained under Gary Lagrange, so he's critiquing everything from St. Thomas, and his view is consistent from the very beginning. He critiques Shaler, he critiques phenomenology, and then in the year 2000, he does the same thing. So I, I think that we need to get past these superficial remarks that are made even today. I've seen seen it in print by trads. Uh, John Paul II mixed and he he mixed things with this evil philosophy of phenomenology. We need to have a deeper analysis here. And it, and it doesn't really help Catholics to just throw around these epithets or these pejorative remarks that don't have the substance and go deep into. So if you want to go deep, go deeper into these things, you can become a guild member, meaningofcatholic.com slash register, where you can access this series. Uh, which is going to be a book eventually. Uh, right now, the series is over six hours long, uh, going deep into John Paul II and St. Marcel the Moderate, so-called question mark. Is he a saint? Is he not? And we so we try to uh, really be objective to try to see the, the, the strengths and the weaknesses of both men and make a case for a reasonable and objective betrayal of both men and myth-busting those things. So. That is all we have today. So thanks for watching. With that, let's offer it all to Our Lady as always. And we'll invoke our lay patrons here at Meaning of Catholic. In nomine Patris, et Vidi, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tua mudiatibus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre. Amen. Our Lady of Victory, pray for us. Mary, Queen of the Home, pray for us. Saint Joseph, Terror of Demons, pray for us. Saint Anthony of the Desert, pray for all clergy and seminarians. In nomine Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Jesus is King. Amen.